guys, my name is Hornet, and today we're going to be covering some of the basics in regards to Firewheel's aircraft, their systems, how to utilize certain weapons, and how to basically use these things uh, in a basic sense in your operations within Arma 3. So, Firewheel's aircraft is a wide variety of mods um, that are compiled in a all-in-one pack on the Steam Workshop if you so desire, or you can get each aircraft individually, but they all run off of the Firewheel weapon system mod, which basically integrates all the different ordnance, all the different things that you're going to need for these aircraft. So in this video, we're going to be covering a few points of Firewheel's mods, and in particular, the weapon systems and how to utilize all the different uh, systems on board the aircraft. So in front of me here, I've got a selection of five aircraft. These are the ones that we have used within our operations here at 10MD. Uh, from left to right, we have the F-15, this one being the Strike Eagle, the F-22 Raptor, the F-15C Viper, the A-10C Warthog, and then the F-A-18 Super Hornet. All of these aircraft have their own strengths. Some of them have their own systems, and they all have their own purpose on the battlefield but before we go into any of that first off i'm going to start with the basics of firewall's weapon system and in particular how to arm the aircraft so each of these aircraft are fully configurable for your mission spec you can select the ordnance that you wish to bring into the battle and because this is arma 3 and not dcs there are no weight limitations there are no downsides to bringing too much other than making your aircraft look ridiculous so there is no modesty when it comes to arming these aircraft other than the modesty that you put on yourself but before we go setting up any of these aircraft for their pylons what we're going to need in order to do that is if we wish to rearm it while in the mission as i am now we're going to need this object here this is the missile rack for rearming, and this can be found under Firewheel objects or FIR objects in the 3D editor or within Zeus. If we check supplies, fire objects, and we have the missile carrier for rearming. This object will allow you to rearm an aircraft within a distance of about 150 meters. If you do not have this present, you will not be able to use the AMS to rearm these aircraft and we'll go into the AMS here in just a second. The other way that you can rearm these aircraft or set them up for your mission is you can individually select the aircraft through either the Eden editor or through Zeus. Through Zeus we check the pylons tab and this will allow us to change all of our ordnance and everything that we need here. Um, if it's in the 3D editor it'll be within the attributes and there will be a drop down tab for the pylon settings, which you can do the same um, adjustment of the loadout there. So moving on from how we set up the AMS, let's actually show you the AMS itself. So the AMS is essentially the system that Firewall has implemented so that you can set whatever weapons that you want onto each pylon individually. You can also adjust things like paint scheme, putting your name on the side of the cockpit, all kinds of little details like that. So to access the AMS, firstly, again, we need to have the missile carrier for rearming within a, a certain distance of the aircraft. It's about 150 meters. If we have that then, all we need to do is scroll and go to the blue open AMS on the scroll menu. This will bring up the armament management system or AMS. And here we can start playing around with things. Now, this did get updated recently. The AMS, you know, didn't look like this a couple of months ago. Um, but we will cover how this works here. And this will be the most up to date as of the time of this video. So to set up everything that we need, what we need to do is select our station or hard point, And then select the weapon that we wish to go on that hard point. For example, if I select station one, which we can see here is our very left wingtip, because we're looking at this head on, 
This is the left side of the aircraft. This would be on the very, very wingtip. This would be an air-to-air -air missile rack, typically. So in order to set the ordinance that we wish, we select Station 1, and then we get the list of weapons that are compatible for that station. You'll see if we select a different station, say Hardpoint 4, which is more of a ground attack or fuel tank um, hardpoint, we get a wider selection of munitions and equipment that we can place there. So it's dependent on what's available on your station. But starting with station one, this is an air to air pylon. So you're going to have a list of your different missiles. In particular, we have the AIM 9 in its variants from early to late. We have the AIM 120. We have the IRIST, which is a bit of a newer missile. It's got a bit more, it's got thrust vectoring, so it's a little bit more maneuverable. And the AIM 132 ASRAM. The ACME. Tacts and cubic pods are for training purposes. It's basically to simulate missiles firing. And if you and the receiving aircraft have both of these on, you'll be able to both fire and receive simulated missile strikes. It's very, very useful for training. You know, it's basically a, in ARMA at least, it's basically an invisible missile that if it hits you, it won't damage the aircraft. So you can do it as much as you like. The CAT-M for the 120s and AIM-9s, those are your training missiles. So again, tie these with the ACME pods and you will be able to simulate trainings. Smoke winders are simply just for show. It's just a smoke pod that you know makes it cool for air shows. But all we have to do in order for this to apply to the aircraft is again, select our station and select a weapon. In this case, I'm gonna go with the AIM-120 as that's a standard F-16 configuration. We'll also do this for station nine as that's the opposite. So once I click on the weapon, that is going to be selected on the hard point and we can see what weapon has been selected for that hard point when it turns green and shows us a little check mark. So let's go ahead and fill out the rest of these pylons for a pretty standard F-16 type loadout. So we're gonna go station three, actually station two, sorry, this one here, and station eight, both of those are gonna be our AIM-9Xs. Again, a lot of different options that we could choose there. It's interesting actually, the station two and station eight, even though they're technically the same station, apparently this one can carry all the ordnance. That seems like a bug, but anyway. So we'll continue on. Station three, uh, we are going to do a simple laser guided bomb configuration. This would be a pretty standard F-16 style loadout. Station five is the underbelly. Sometimes if you switch stations after scrolling down, it won't show up. Just grab the little slide bar here and it'll reappear. And for this one, we're gonna take a jammer pod Let's see. Yeah, we'll go with the 188. Now, this is our um, targeting pod station. So typically, I'll go with a lightning pod. Um, in Arma, this doesn't make too much of a difference. It's still going to have a targeting pod. It just means that once you arm this, it'll allow you to enter the ITGT, which we'll get onto in a little bit. And finally, for station seven, we're gonna go again at GBU-10. Station 10. Oh, wait. He forgot station six. Fire will. I found a bug. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll make that, uh, I'll make a ticket for fire will there to <laughs> correct that. Whoops. So we'll go ahead and set this one as our, so this is actually station seven. That needs to be that, and this needs to be a fuel tank. Little bug, not to worry. All right, so now we have our loadout selected. So we've got four air-to-air -air missiles, being two M9s, two M120s. We have two GBU-10s, which are 2,000-pound bombs, and we have two fuel tanks and a jammer pod. 
Once we have this set up, there's a few things we can do. We can apply the loadout right now, and that'll set everything up. It'll take a little bit of time for the weapons to be applied. Or we can add a preset. So if I want to save this configuration and say, okay, this is going to be a standard loadout, you know, I'll say, um, let's say uh, GBU 10 strike. That's what we'll call the preset. All we have to do is input a name and hit add. And that will then update our preset manager and add our custom configuration down here. So what we can do with this then is if I set up a bunch of different configurations, some of these being these are the ones that come with the aircraft already. Um, but rather than having to do all this and select it individually, I can click the preset and then hit apply because see here it's changed our hard points. Same with this one, changes the hard points for you. So you don't need to do anything but select the preset. If you want to remove preset, just hit remove, simple as. Now, once that has all been set up and we're happy with the loadout and we want to apply it to the aircraft, all we have to do is hit apply and that will start the AMS. Now, important note, which just happened there. Sometimes that does occur. Real quick, I'm going to turn off my engine because my throttle was up a little bit. If the uh, engine is running, the AMS will not operate. The engine has to be off in order for the AMS to work. Again, we're going to start the AMS. And there we go. So now our pylons are loaded. We can see we've got our fuel tanks, we've got our GBU-10s, and we've got our air-to-air -air missiles. This will be a pretty typical F-16 kind of strike loadout. It's not a, you know, doesn't have a shit ton of stuff on it, but this would be fast, maneuverable, and able to strike and get away. So that is the AMS in a nutshell. And again, you can spend a bunch of time here setting up whatever kind of loadout that you want. You know, and again, there is no necessary uh, limitation on things that you can bring. So I can pack this out with a fuck ton of ordnance and it will still fly exactly the same. It doesn't change the flight characteristics. It doesn't change pretty much anything. Also, yeah. <laughs> now, another thing to note uh, about the AMS, which is very, very nice, is it will tell you what it is that you're applying to the aircraft. So as you can see, as I'm adding stuff here, it will give me this page which describes the ordnance if there is a page for that particular ordnance. So for example, with our thermobaric GBU-24A here, um, that doesn't quite exist. So it just gives me this. Thank you, Firewell. But for uh, weapons that it does have a description for, it will display the missile or whatever type of ordinance that you're trying to apply. It'll tell you what it's for. So in this case, it's air to air, since we can shoot down planes and helicopters with it. Also designated here, A2A, air to air. It tells you its guidance. So for this one, it's uh, active radar, or radar active, meaning it's a FOX-3. This will change if we select something else, like the AIM-9, which will be infrared guided. And it also gives us a range. So this missile will lock and fire out to 16 kilometers and at a minimum of 700 meters whereas the aim 9 can only lock and fire out to 5 kilometers or as close as 10 meters this is quite helpful for certain types of munition so for example air to ground you want to know what kind of guidance it has what it's kind of capable of so for example if we pick our mavericks here we can see what it's good against so we can engage light vehicles tanks and structures and again this is air to ground a2g this particular maverick has an electro optical guidance so doesn't need heat doesn't need a laser it is basically a computer that can recognize shapes and it can tell when it's looking at a vehicle so literally anything on the sensor this thing will be able to lock onto and fire 
this has a max range out to six kilometers. But we can see if we change the type of Maverick, say we go for the Delta variant, this is an infrared guided Maverick. So this will need heat. This will need an engine running in order to lock onto it. The G variant, I believe is just a naval variant. It's the same as it's just an infrared guided or the uh, actually I think it might have a different warhead if I remember correctly K variant again different warhead electro optical laser guided and so on we can also tell with different things um, how they kind of work so the harpoon here this one is a little bit different because it is active radar and it'll lock onto and fire up on ships and can be used against tanks um, but I believe the Harpoon also has a GPS guidance function where you can set up terminal guidance and everything. Um, and yeah, so we can see all the different things here. This one is infrared or GPS guided, and this one has command guidance. So if you have the data link pod, you will actively be able to um, control this missile when it gets into terminal guidance and all kinds of stuff. So this will give us every little detail about you know what we're using how it works you know high drive for snake eyes so on very very useful and i'm glad that uh, firewheel came up with this system because this clarifies a lot of things so but that is essentially the ams for everything very very useful system Now, a couple of other things with the AMS is it can be aircraft dependent. So we'll see here if I switch to the Raptor and I open the AMS, we can see it's a little bit different. It's got different names for all of the things and different uh, notes for here. So for example, um, on the Raptor, in order to equip the air to ground stations, the air to air internal stations have to be empty or two, three, four, and five must be empty. Um, different things like that, let you know, and then our external weapons pods and so on. There is also on the AMS in tandem aircraft, for example, the Strike Eagle or a tandem F-16, tandem F-18. If we open the AMS here, there is a selection for gunner. This is basically to select a weapon that is going to be within the Wizzo's control, so the backseater's control. So for example, if I want, say, a GPS guided bomb, let's go to GBU-38, if I want that to be in control of the Wizzo and not the pilot, I have to select Gunner and select that. And if I just apply that, you know, real quickly, it'll add the bomb, it'll get rid of all the rest of this stuff. Yeah, it just takes a minute because the Strike Eagle has a lot of shit on it. Okay, so we can see here that the pilot only has control of the Vulcan and nothing else. But if I jump out and go to the Wizzo seat, we can see that the Wizzo has his 500 pound JDAM. And that's how we basically distinguish which um, seat has which. So. Very useful if you're going to be using a Wizzo and, you know, the Wizzo can take care of designating targets for GPS guided bombs and, you know, lasing targets and so on. So very, very nice, very, very useful. Okay, so now we're going to do a quick demo on jammer pods and how they work. So a jammer pod is essentially an electronic warfare system that's going to try its best when activated to jam and throw off the guidance of incoming radar guided missiles. So if there is a long range or any kind of radar guided missile fired towards you and the jammer is active, it'll try its best to scramble the missile. And if it can defeat it and overwhelm it, it will throw off the guidance and essentially that missile won't be an issue anymore. But again, this only works for radar guided missiles. If something, you know, some kind of short range air defense or an enemy aircraft or something fires an infrared guided missile at you, it will not jam and it will actually warn you that an infrared guided missile has been detected 
you know, start throwing chaff and players and evading. So, quick demo on this. We'll go ahead and fly up a little bit just to see if our friend sees us. We do have a Rhea and Kronos set up down here at the airport, which there they are. And currently they seem to be sleeping. So what I'll do is get their attention right quick. So currently his radar is off, so I won't actually be able to use a harm on him, but there we go. Now his radar is on because I pissed him off. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is, because that radar is on, I'm going to activate our ECM, and now he's attempting to get a lock. Now the ECM will only work for a certain period of time. This is not a turn it on and become invincible type thing. You need to know when to use it. I believe it lasts, depending on the type, for about 120 seconds. So that missile is incoming. We're going to try and dodge. There we go. So it's constantly giving me updates on if it's jamming it or not. And it's warning me to drop countermeasures if it uh, you know, is unable to jam it. But it managed to jam two of them. There we go again. Smoke in the air, that's good. Jink. There we go. So very importantly, you know, again, countermeasure alone will not save you. You need to be able to also move to make it as hard as possible for that missile, you know, if it happens to either ignore or basically defeat the countermeasures. So, that's a demo on how the ECM works. Again, this will only work for a certain period of time. After a little second here, it should tell us that it's out of charge and it's uh, starting to recharge. Luckily, our Rhea here seems to be out of missiles for the minute. So that's no longer a threat to us for the minute. Now, once the jammer uh, runs out of charge, it'll take uh, about 40 seconds to recharge depending on the variant. Some take longer, some take shorter. It will let you know uh, with the pop-up. I think the most up-to-date one takes about 40 seconds. But we'll see here in a second, the ECM will turn itself off and let you know that it's recharging. In the meantime here, I am going to quickly switch to our harms and go knock out this radar. There we go. Locked on. Magnum. There we go. Okay, so you see there, ECM is off. Standby for recharging in 53 seconds. So again, this is a situational usage kind of thing. You can turn it off, and that way it won't use up all of its charge, and it'll basically recharge itself. Um, you know, but you can't just turn it on and leave it on and expect to be fine. You need to be able to use these at the right time. So. That's essentially how the ECM system works. Now, I know that Firewheel has um, the EA-18 Growler, and I think recently he has uh, released the uh, old Prowlers as well. Those are electronic warfare aircraft, and they have like a dedicated um, ECM suite. There we go, our ECM is standby, so it's recharged. They have a dedicated ECM suite, so that has its own systems, which I won't be getting into here, because frankly, I have not flown them. I, I haven't learned the systems yet. But alas, that is our ECM. All right, so now that we've covered jammer pods, next up is going to be the ITGT. So this one I've covered previously, where I was demoing how we can strike multiple targets with the ITGT and went into it a little bit there. This one's going to be a bit more of a deep dive on everything and how it works. So on board the aircraft at the moment, I have four GBU-31s. Those are all 2,000 pound GPS guided bombs. So a couple of notes on the ITGT. First and foremost, you need to have both a GPS guided weapon on the aircraft in order for it to show on the list of the ITGT. If you have nothing that's GPS guided, there won't be anything on the list and you won't be able to GPS guide because you ain't got none to guide. Secondly is you must have a targeting pod 
on the aircraft. So lightning, sniper, lantern, any of those. And in this case, I believe this is a Sniper XR pod with a HTS. It has to be on the aircraft in order for you to be able to access the ITGT. And finally, the aircraft's engine must actually be powered on for the ITGT to show up. So, with all those covered, let's open up the ITGT and go into a little bit of this. So, we scroll down, we go to Open ITGT. I believe that stands for Inertial Targeting Guidance something, something, something. <laughs> I don't know the acronym. So, we open up the ITGT here. Now, again, we can fly the aircraft while this is open, which is a nice change to a previous iteration where you could not control the aircraft and it set your throttle to zero. So now we can actually control it and you know maintain altitude and everything. Now, there's a couple of things on this and I know it looks a little bit jarring, but we'll cover them one by one. So starting on the left, we have our different panels here or different toggles uh, in order to select different areas. First of all, we have DGN, which is designate. This will allow us to designate a target using this map here within the ITGT. So if we have a map marker or any kind of you know identification on where something is, say you're striking a landmark on a hill or a particular building in a village or whatever it might be, you can hit designate and simply click somewhere on the maps. In this case, we're going to click on the hangars. Some buildings are more dis you know, discernible than others. So now that it's designated, we have you know our target designation, the number starting at zero, and then the name of the person who has selected it. This will then show up in our list. You see your target zero and my name. We also see in the list here our list of ordinance, but we'll get to that in a minute. So that's how we designate a point. The SEL is selection. So this is basically sending the information to a pylon to an essentially activate the guidance. We have clear, which will remove the targeting information from a target. So if I want to basically free a bomb from a designation and set it to a different one, I must select the bomb and select the target and hit clear. That will remove the targeting info from that pylon. Delete, pretty simple. It will delete a, a target designation once you have selected it in the list. And edit, we'll get to in a little minute. It basically allows you to change certain properties of certain types of munitions. I'll get to that in a moment. On the top row here, we have the map button, which will simply take us back to this little map. The list, which will display our pylons, so what weapons and on which station they reside going from hard point 3, hard point 4, hard point 7, and hard point 8. It'll also show what type of ordnance it is, so in this case all of GVU-31s. We have the target list then, which is again all of our designations, in this case we only have the 1, so it'll be target 0. Marker is a work in progress, hasn't been set yet, and reset also work in progress, hasn't been set yet. On the bottom here we have enter and a little gray box. This is important because if we are you know, running on a GPS guided uh, munition and a JTAC or somebody has a designation for us, particularly in you know, 8 or 10 digit grid, we can enter an 8 or 10 digit grid number here in this little gray box. Once you click on it, we can start typing in it and setting up our grid. So I can quickly, you know, take that from what the JTAC has read out to me on your 5 or 9 line and quickly input it into that little box. So for example, if I take, say, let's go, meh, our targets are about here, so 04950735, right? So 04950735. So now I have our 8 digit grid and I hit enter and that has been updated into our target list. Next thing we have gr check grid which if we select this and click somewhere on the map it'll give us coordinates in a 8 or 10 digit, in this case it looks like a 12 digit um, reference. So if I want to check what the grid of something is 
I can quickly hit grid, click that, and it'll tell me that's, you know, grid 468706, right? And you can go further if you want to with more accurate uh, designations. POI stands for point of interest. This is where if we are looking at something in our targeting pod, I'm also going to quickly turn around here because I am nowhere near the map anymore. But if we are in our targeting pod, right, so we do this by, again, either left control, right click, or, you know, if you set up a hotkey for it, this will take you into your targeting pod. You must be in the targeting pod and have the ITGT open in order for point of interest to work. Otherwise, you're not looking at anything and it's not going to mark anything. So point of interest, as I showed last time uh, we used it in our, our demo with the F-15, is basically, um, you know, if I lock the turret to something and I hit POI, That'll update the target list. Now I'm way outside the map, so there is no target, but it's there in the list. That's essentially a point of interest. Finally, then we have slew, which will basically, if I hit slew and click somewhere on the map, that will sling our targeting pod around and essentially lock it to the terrain. You know, so it's it's handy for being able to move the TGT around or the TGP around to look at something on the ground. It's very very nice. And finally, exit just closes the ITGT. So with that spiel out of the way, I know it's a lot. We'll get into how it works individually. So again, there are different ways, uh, three different ways that we can designate a target. We can either designate and click we can enter a grid and click enter or we can be looking in a targeting pod and hit poi and that'll update all of these into the targeting pod so with all that being said let's start designating our bombs on target so for this exercise our target which you can kind of see there on the sensor there they are it is one platoon of tanks, being the Varsuks, and one platoon of MLRS, basically BM-21s. So, the easiest way for me to designate these would be to go into ITGT and hit POI, because I'm already looking at it, I know exactly where they are. Now, so we can see that that final designation that I made is target 3. I'm going to go ahead and delete the other targets just for the sake of preventing confusion. Delete, delete, delete. And now we have the one. Now, if we go ahead and. One moment here. If we go ahead and select our munition and our target number, we can send that information with SEL and that'll lock the pylon onto the target. So that bomb is now ready to lock and fire on that area. So, now that that's set up, we can select our GB31 that we have here on the cockpit. We need to make sure that it is in ITGT mode in order for it to pick up the GPS. If we fire this in direct mode, it will not follow a GPS guidance and you're effectively dumb bombing with it. So make sure you're in ITGT mode. You can also see in the top right, we have the you know fire selector indicator where it shows a little inverted triangle. That'll let you know that it's also in ITGT mode or check the heads up display. Now, before I drop this bomb, I have been asked in a previous video how to tell which bomb is going to drop. Because just because you've selected a bomb for a target doesn't mean that that particular bomb is going to be the one that drops next in the sequence. Unfortunately, with Firewall System, we can't select a individual pylon and drop it like we do in the likes of DCS. But we can do a couple of things in order to make sure that the right bomb is dropping or to ensure, you know, that we want a particular bomb on a particular pylon to drop first. So the first way is the most simple way. 
Typically, bombs will drop from the outermost pylons, alternating between left to right to left to right, and essentially work their way into the center of the aircraft, right, for balance reasons. So in the F-16 here, we can see on our left wing, the outermost pylon that's next to the AIM-9, that's going to drop first. Then it'll switch to the right wing with the outermost pylon next to the AIM-9. Then it'll go left on the inboard station and right on the inboard station. So go left, right, left, right, working its way towards the center of the aircraft. This can be a little bit different on certain airframes. I know the F-15 is a nightmare for this because it's basically impossible to tell which pylon is which on the ITGT. I'd really recommend if you're running the F-15, just stick to like two guided munitions or four guided munitions and know which pylons that they're on so you can use them right. Um, you know, don't pack it with a fuck ton of GBU-38s because you're just going to confuse yourself. Stick to laser guided bombs for, for that kind of thing. Now, the other way that we can ensure that the right bomb drops is we can go to our edit, which I'll talk about a little bit earlier. And we can change the pylon priority. The pylon priority basically dictates which bomb is going to drop first based upon which has the highest value. So for example, if we select higher point seven, which would be the last bomb to drop in the sequence, because again, it goes left, right, left, right. Okay, because this is outer pylon, outer pylon, inner pylon, inner pylon, going left, right, left, right. So, higher point 7 in this case would be the last one to drop. So, if I wanted this one to drop first, I go to edit, and there's a few things that I can do here. We can change the mode, which is dependent on the munition, right? In this case, these are purely JDAMs, they don't have laser guidance, they don't have command guidance, they have none of that, so you have to stay on GPS mode. If you have an LJDAM, which has both laser and GPS guided, like an EGBU-12 or an LJDAM uh, GBU-56, um, you can set it to dual, which will follow the GPS guidance on the drop, and then when it gets closer to the target, it'll switch into terminal guidance, which is kind of the final stage of, of guidance, and it'll switch from following a GPS to following a laser designator. That can be kind of handy for using GPS guided munitions to hit moving targets, otherwise you're not really going to be able to hit something on the move. Command guidance and command guidance terminal, those are purely for cruise missiles, right, and TV guided shit. It basically just means that if you have command guidance from the get-go, as soon as you fire that, you know, long-range cruise missile, uh, if it's compatible with it and if you have the ADLP data link pod, it'll immediately switch into your control so you'll stop controlling the aircraft you'll go into like a little drone camera and it'll be a mouse controlled uh, flight system for the cruise missile and you can basically fly it where you want to or if you set it to command guidance terminal it'll fly itself towards the gps location and then at the last moment before impact it'll switch it into your control and you can move it around to you know hit whatever you want specifically so that's what the mode does here Second thing here is pylon priority. This is what I'm talking about for setting up which pylon you want to drop first. So typically, if you set a pylon to 10, which I believe is the max figure, but I'll need to double check that. But if you set a pylon to 10, that's going to be the pylon that drops first, right? So if we go ahead and set higher point 7 to pylon priority 10, and I select this to ensure that it will actually send that information through and hit apply. It's now changed. So you can see here, pylon priority goes three, four, two, three, one, one, right? So the lower the figure, the higher, um, or sorry, the lower the figure, the less prioritized it is, the higher the figure, you know, the, the highest figure is gonna drop first in essence. So we can see here that higher point 7 is now a priority of 10. So that's going to be the first thing to drop. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and head back to our target, which is just over here to our left. There we go. So, if we look from the outside of the aircraft, Station 7, which again is the inboard right side pylon, should drop first. There it is. 
All right, we're in ITGT mode. Let's check pile on seven. Pickle, and there it goes. So if you want to be absolutely sure that a particular bomb is going to drop first, you want to set its uh, pylon priority up to, you know, a high figure. All right, we'll just see that splash, and most of it should disappear. And... GPS data not found. Oh, I'm an idiot. I did not. <laughs> I I forgot to set up the uh, the guidance. I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> important note: make sure that the right pylon and the right target is set up. I set higher point three and forgot to set higher point seven. So, we'll redo that. We'll set higher point eight. We'll edit. We'll set pylon priority to like eleven if I can. I don't know if you can. Oh, I can. All right. So now we'll try that again. Now it's actually set to, you know, guide to the actual target. So we need to fly over here. There we go. So a little slip up on my part. Again, GPS guided stuff can be a little bit confusing. It takes a lot of time to get used to them. And you really have to be procedural about it. So, here we go, we're set up, now we're in ITGT mode, higher point 8, which is on the right side, should drop first. And pickle, there it goes. And GPS mo mode activated, so that's actually guiding now. So that was a little slip up on my part. And here we go. Target acquired, so it's found the GPS info, and... Here it comes, splash, and everything's gone. 2,000 pound bombs, pretty fucking powerful. So, that is the ITGT. That is everything from setting up the designation, to setting pylon priority, to setting the mode, and all of that. So that's exactly how GPS guided munitions work. Now, as a quick demo, just again to solidify the point of Typically on most aircraft, the pylon priority will go left, right, left, right to the center. I'll just quickly drop all four and just let you see that. So it'll go left, right, left, right towards the center. That's all it takes. So again, this is dumb bombing, so these guys are just going to fall until we hit the dirt. Oh, that poor city. Oh, no, we missed the city. There we go. All right, so that's the ITGT. Takes a bit of getting used to, do get some time in on it in the editor, but you will get proficient in this once you kind of put the time in and, and get used to designating things and whatnot. And again, if we want to remove the target designation, so if I set this up, I go, ITGT, POI, list, select, right? If I want to remove this, I can't just hit delete because the target's designated, it has a pylon using the data. You need to select the pylon, select the target, and hit clear. That'll remove the data from the pylon, and then I can delete the target. And that is that. So, that's our ITGT. Okay, so next thing that I want to go through with Firewell systems are a couple of the things regarding ordnance and some of the distinctions that exist. So, uh, on board the aircraft at the moment, we've got a couple of special munitions here. So, we have a set of cluster bombs. One uh, set of those clusters is a Gator, which is a CBU-89. Uh, and the other set is a CBU-97. We'll get into those in a second. And then we also have two GBU-24s. One is a BLU-118, which is a thermobaric warhead. And the other is a BLU-109, which is a bunker buster warhead. 
Now, some of the special ones, even though they're the same bomb, you may need to select them in the scroll menu. For example, here to switch from the BLU-109 to the BLU-118, I have to scroll and select it. And that'll reload the correct type. And that's, you know, how we can choose which one we want to drop. In the case of the two CBUs, those are different designations, and thus, you know, they have their own separate um, station within the weapon selection. Now, a couple of things uh, in relation to ordnance with Firewheel is you can kind of get an idea of what they are and what they're for based upon their name, right? So, for example, both of our cluster bombs are CBU, right? So it's a cluster bomb unit, I think is what that designation stands for. And then our GBU, is our guided bomb unit, that's our GB24s, right? So the number may change depending on the type, so CBU89 versus CBU97, GBU24 versus GBU12, and all sorts. So there are differences with the number. A 12 is a laser guided 500 pound bomb, a 24 is a laser guided 2000 pound bomb, you know, so you need to kind of be able to differentiate them based on how powerful they are but the initial designation of cbu gbu aim right is uh, an you know basically an air to air missile right and then you have agm for air to ground missile all those designations kind of give you an idea as to what they're for. But again, you can learn all this through looking at the AMS and kind of practicing with different munitions and seeing what they do. So, first things first, we'll start with the BLU-109 on the GBU-24. So the BLU-109, as I said, is a bunker buster. Now, what does that mean for ARMA, right? Because we tend not to have a lot of underground stuff except for, you know, prairie fire and that kind of thing uh, that kind of thing but what we can do with a bunker buster is when we drop this and it impacts a structure for example this you know armored ammunition dump all right that could be considered a bunker what it will do is as soon as it strikes a target it will run a script and try its best to basically it'll delete the building or structure and replace it with the closest form of rubble that can try its best to represent it so it'll look somewhat similar, right? And this thing can remove pretty much most buildings, if not all buildings. I'm talking one hit on a factory building, one hit on the concrete bunkers, one hit on some bridges, and it will disappear and replace it with rubble. So the BLU-109 is a incredibly useful tool, especially if you're up against a hard-earned, you know, hard-earned fortification uh, kind of defensive area. So as an example, actually a better example would be if I go down here and I select, let's see, this guy. All right, pretty heavy bunker it's basically impossible to destroy these things in, in the vanilla game. Same with the tall ones, right? These things are next to impossible to destroy in the base game. But, if I go ahead and switch over to our target here, which I believe is over, there they are. If I go ahead and drop this bunker booster on this thing, it'll physically remove it, and the script will run to swap it out. So pickle. and splash big boom and now if we look back at it that bunker is gone and it is replaced the bunker with the ruins of a house <laughs> so again it's just trying its best to replace the rubble with something that is vaguely the same size and shape and everything it won't always be perfect. I know it removes like factory buildings and puts this there instead. But a few hits, you know, most buildings, it'll try its best to replace it with something that is as close as possible. But the BLU-109 is a very, very useful tool for removing hardened structures, even ones that normally you wouldn't be able to destroy. Our other friend, the BLU-118, as I said, is a thermobaric warhead. That's basically a fuel air bomb, 
And we've seen a few of these in use in the current uh, Russian-Ukraine conflict, and they're pretty fucking powerful. Sometimes they've been called vacuum bombs, it's not entirely what they are, I won't go into that here, but... Essentially, in Arma, this bomb will destroy any building within 300 meters and kill any infantry out to 500 meters. This thing is ridiculously powerful. So I'm going to drop, and I'm going to fly the fuck away, because if I'm within like a kilometer of this thing in the air, it, I will be destroyed. It will completely remove me. So here it comes. Splash. And every one of those buildings has now just been leveled. Even out here. This thing will basically remove an objective in an operation. So <laughs> try not to, you know, ruin all the infantry's fun when using this thing. We in the 10MD pretty much don't allow the use for these unless it's for a very specific mission. Um, but they are very powerful. Like, everything here is just leveled. Now, on to some of the cluster bombs. The CBU-89 Gator is, rather than being a cluster munition per se, in this traditional sense, this is a mine layer. So if I fly over a target area, so I'll fly along the runway here, and I drop these things, it'll scatter a mixed anti-personnel and anti-tank mindset and basically make an area you know impenetrable and without like EOD and support assets so I'll fly along here go yep yep those will burst and lay a fuck ton of mines now I was going a bit fast for that but we'll see if the first one deployed because I believe it hit somewhere on the runway. So we'll see here. I may need to rearm these things. I uh, <laughs> I was treating them like snake eyes when I really shouldn't. But basically, it will lay a path of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines, make an area an area impassable. It's kind of nice. The other type of CBU that I've got on board here are the CBU-97s. These are called sensor-fused weapons. It's a smart cluster bomb that each of the bomblets will be able to tell, you know, that there's a vehicle underneath it, and it'll specifically fire a shaped charge into the vehicle that it detects. This thing, in Arma at least, has no UXO, no trace, no remnants, so infantry can walk in after this thing and nothing will happen to them. But every vehicle it detects will basically be disabled if not destroyed. So let's go ahead and pickle. There it goes, and I'll actually switch the camera because this one's quite fun to watch. So there we go. There's the little parachutes. And every one of these vehicles just got hit. All the crew have dismounted and these things are Cooking off missiles, doing all kinds of fun stuff. And this thing will remove like an entire company worth of tanks and vehicles. And again, no UXO. There is nothing left behind. Other than, you know, the bodies of the dead. So, Firewheel has a bunch of ordnance that, you know, can be used in a wide variety of different, you know, applications and things like that. Um, and you can really fuck shit up with these things, so. But, that's our little snippet on ordnance and different things that you can bring. There is a massive variety of them, so I won't be covering each and every single type of ordnance, because there are, frankly, too many. Um, but it's just a showcase to show how much Firewheel has uh, for your disposal. Alright, so for the final step of this Firewheel uh, video, I'm going to be going over just general weapons employment, the difference between employing certain types of weapons, and just some general notes. So, again, Firewheel has a wide variety of different ordnance types and all sorts that you can use. 
some of them need to be employed a little bit differently than others um, but generally speaking you know it's it's fairly straightforward so we're going to go ahead and take off here in our a10 so on board at the moment we have our aim nines we have our gbu 12s we have a pair of gbu 54 l jdams we have our agm 65 mavericks those are our anti-tank guided missiles we've got some hydras and of course it's an a10 so we got big bird so some of these weapon systems need to be employed a little bit differently than others again the uh, GBU-54s um, are GPS guided bombs, so we use the ITGT like we showed before. These ones can be either GPS or laser guided, so you don't necessarily need to set up the GPS and everything else. You can just drop them laser guided like a GPU-12, um, as long as you know it's in the vicinity of the laser. Um, the Mavericks, these ones in particular, are infrared guided, so these will need the engine of the enemy vehicle to be running. Uh, or recently have been running in order for it to properly get a lock. Hydra's are self-explanatory. It's just a rocket pod. You just point wherever the CCP is and you'll get a hit. So, let's employ some weapons. First and foremost, let's go with our Mavericks. So these guys are nice and hot, so their engines have been running, so I should be able to. Yep, there we go. That's our lock. So in order to get a lock by default, you can either press T, which will bore sight it. Bore sight basically mean meaning that anything that is directly in front of the aircraft, where this itty bitty little crosshair is, that's you know in the little plus that I have here on my heads up display. That itty bitty little cross is your bore sight. You put that on top of an enemy vehicle and press T, and it'll lock whatever's directly in front of you. However, What's more useful is if you tap R by default for Romeo, um, it will cycle through all available targets that are on your, your sensor suite, as long as you're within the seeker you know, head on, on whatever missile you're trying to use. So you can see here, I'm tapping my select next target keybind, uh, which I have on my Hotas, but R by default will do the same thing. You can cycle between targets there. Locally with Firewheel system, uh, you don't need to wait a stupidly long time for Mavericks to lock on. It's just simply lock and go. It's not like vanilla where it takes like 20 seconds to get a lock for some reason. So, let's go ahead and fire our AGMs here. We're nice and lined up. Rifle. And next target, rifle. And shack. They're actually popping smoke to try and get away from it. So, that's how you employ our air-to-ground missiles. That applies to Mavericks, Harms, pretty much anything that you're going to be getting an infrared or, um, you know, uh, electro-optical lock-on. Same with uh, your infrared and radar-guided missiles for air-to-air. -air. It's the same thing. Just as long as you tap R or select next target, if it's in the sensor suite and at the right angle, it will secure that lock. Now, for our next target, we'll go with laser gutter bombs. So, when dropping bombs, it's important to remember that bombs are not hyper-maneuverable. You're not going to be able to drop it at like a 90 degree angle and expect the bomb to maintain enough energy to actually go towards the target area. You do need to fly in a relatively close, you know, area, um, or within a certain, you know, angle that the seeker head can actually find the laser and follow it. So, for example, here, Got my laser on this tank here. We can see if I pull the nose towards it. Let's see. Normally there's a little crosshair here. I'll actually just unlock and go forward. So you can see. That would be why. So we can see when I select a bomb here, there's a little crosshair there. That's our CCIP. That's basically telling me where this bomb is going to land. So you need to make sure that the CCIP is relatively close, obviously not directly on top of, because it doesn't need to be that precise, but the CCIP needs to be relatively close to whatever it is that you're trying to bomb, right? Because again, if I drop it here at a 90 degree angle, this bomb will not hit. I need to fly it towards the area, to where the CCIP is somewhat in the region, 
and then I can drop pickle. And that should just follow this laser. Now I can move this laser around and the bomb will just follow it to as best its ability. You can hit moving targets with laser gutter bombs as long as they're moving relatively slow enough or if you, you know, lead it correctly. And splash. And again, you don't necessarily need to like lock onto the laser per se. Um, as you can see up top right, it says L O A L. That stands for lock on after launch. So as soon as you drop this bomb, it'll find whatever laser it can see and follow that. For our L J dams, again, I can either file, fire them in L O A L, where it'll just drop and follow the laser. I'll go ahead and smack this group of infantry right quick. Or I can drop this thing with GPS guidance and, you know, do it that way. I've actually made that tank dismount from that, from that hit. So bombs all drop relatively the same. You can guide them. You can dumb bomb them. Um, you know, just by flying towards it. You'll see here it's got a CCIP. If I put that on top of a target and drop it, it'll, you know, go wherever the CCIP kind of last had it. So, like so. Uh, this might be close for comfort. No, we're good. So you can dome bomb it like that. You can guide it. You know, all depends on the sensor suite that the bomb has. Finally, then we got hydras and cannon. Pretty straightforward. You need to be pointing at whatever it is because that's where the CCIP is. You just put that over your target and you pull the trigger as many times as you need to destroy the target. Let me give a little. Gotta love it. So, that is our weapons employment. Air to ground missiles all work relatively the same. You know, unguided munitions like rockets and such and cannon fire all work exactly the same and dropping bombs all works relatively the same. Now, GPS guided bombs um, have a little bit more, you know, you, you don't necessarily need it to find the seeker head, so you can drop them, you know, relatively, like, way high up, and you don't need the CCIP to be super, super close. But as long as you drop it within, you know, a reasonable distance to the, uh, to the target, it'll find the GPS and, and strike it. But that is pretty much most of firewall systems. There are a couple of more specific things like cruise missiles and whatnot, which I won't get into here because frankly, you're not gonna be using them that much. But, you know, there are specific videos out there for it. But that wraps up pretty much everything that we need for firewall. That's our ITGT, that's our weapons deployment, that's our jammer pods, you know, all kinds of things like that. So, I hope this helped. I know Firewall, uh, Firewall's mods can be a little bit daunting just because of the complexity of some of the systems. And, you know, it can be a little bit hard to kind of find information on specific things. But, I uh, hope this helped. So, that being said, happy hunting, good luck, and uh, I'll catch you later. Peace.